Welcome to Inglit Mirror. This is an analysis of the first chapter of A.C. Bradley's Shakespearean Tragedy, published in 1904. A.C. Bradley was an English literary scholar, best remembered for his work on Shakespeare. We must remember that the tragic aspect of life is only one aspect. We cannot arrive at Shakespeare's whole dramatic way of looking at the world from his tragedies alone, as we can arrive at Milton's way of regarding things, or at Wordsworth's or at Shelley's by examining almost any one of their important works. And first, to begin from the outside, a tragedy brings before us a considerable number of persons, many more than the persons in a Greek play, unless the members of the chorus are reckoned among them. But it is preeminently the story of one person, the hero, or at most of two, the hero and heroine. It is only in the love tragedies, Romeo and Juliet and Antony and Cleopatra, that the heroine is as much the center of the action as the hero. The story next leads up to and includes the death of the hero. On the one hand, no play at the end of which the hero remains alive is, in the full Shakespearean sense, a tragedy. And we no longer class Troilus and Cressida or simply as much as did the editors of the folio. On the other hand, the story depicts also the troubled part of the hero's life, which proceeds and leads up to his death. And an instantaneous death occurring by accident in the midst of prosperity would not suffice for it. It is in fact essentially a tale of suffering and calamity contacting to death. The suffering and calamity are moreover exceptional. They befall a conspicuous person. They are themselves of some striking kind. They are also as a rule unaccepted and contrasted with previous happiness or glory. Such exceptional suffering and calamity then affecting the hero and, we must now add, generally extending far and wide beyond him, so as to make the whole scene a scene of woe, are an essential ingredient in tragedy and a chief source of the tragic emotions and especially of pity. The proportion of this ingredient and the direction taken by tragic pity will naturally vary greatly. Pity, for example, has a much larger part in King Lear than in Macbeth, and is directed in the one case chiefly to the hero, in the other chiefly to minor characters. To the medieval mind, a tragedy meant a narrative rather than a play, and its notion of the matter of this narrative may readily be gathered from Dante or still better from Chaucer. Shakespeare's idea of the tragic fact is larger than this idea and goes beyond it, but it includes it and it is worthwhile to observe the identity of the two in a certain point which is often ignored. Tragedy with Shakespeare is concerned always with persons of high degree, often with kings or princes, if not with leaders in the state like Coriolanus, Brutus, Antony, at the least, as in Romeo and Juliet, with members of great houses whose quarrels are of public moment. Othello himself is no mere private person. He is the general of the Republic. At the beginning, we see him in the council chamber of the Senate. The consciousness of his high position never leaves him. At the end, 
When he is determined to live no longer, he is as anxious as Hamlet not to be misjudged by the great world. The saying that every deathbed is the scene of the fifth act of a tragedy has its meaning. But it would not be true if the word tragedy bore its dramatic sense. A Shakespearean tragedy, as so far considered, may be called a story of exceptional calamity leading to the death of a man in high estate. No amount of calamity which merely befell a man, descending from the clouds like lightning, or stealing from the darkness like pestilence, could alone provide the substance of its story. The calamities of tragedy do not simply happen, nor are they sent. They proceed mainly from actions, and those the actions of men. This second aspect of tragedy evidently differs greatly from the first. Men, from this point of view, appear to us primarily as agents, themselves the authors of their proper woo, and our fear and pity, though they will not cease or diminish, will be modified accordingly. The story or action of a Shakespearean tragedy does not consist, of course, solely of human actions or deeds, but the deeds are the predominant factor. And these deeds are, for the most part, actions in the full sense of the word, not things done, tween asleep and wake, but acts or omissions thoroughly expressive of the doer, characteristic deeds. The centre of the tragedy, therefore, may be said with equal truth to lie in action issuing from character, or in character issuing in action. Shakespeare's main interest lay here. To say that it lay in mere character, or was a psychological interest, would be a great mistake, for he was dramatic to the tips of his fingers. It would be very difficult, and in his later tragedies perhaps impossible, to detect passages where he has allowed such freedom to the interest in character apart from action. What we do feel strongly as a tragedy advances to its close is that the calamities and catastrophe follow inevitably from the deeds of men and that the main source of these deeds is character. The dictum that, with Shakespeare, character is destiny is no doubt an exaggeration, and one that may mislead, but it is the exaggeration of a vital truth. What elements are to be found in the story or action, occasionally or frequently, beside the characteristic deeds, and the sufferings and circumstances of the persons. I will refer to three of these additional factors. First one, Shakespeare occasionally represents abnormal conditions of mind, insanity, for example, somnambulism, hallucinations, and deeds issuing from these are certainly not what we call deeds in the fullest sense. Deeds expressive of character. No, but these abnormal conditions are never introduced as the origin of deeds of any dramatic moment. Lady Macbeth's sleepwalking has no influence whatever on the events that follow it. Lear's insanity is not the cause of a tragic conflict any more than Ophelia's. It is like Ophelia's the result of a conflict, and in both cases, the effect is mainly pathetic. The second one is, Shakespeare also introduces the supernatural into some of his tragedies. He introduces ghosts and witches who have supernatural knowledge. This supernatural element certainly cannot in most cases, if in any, be explained away as an illusion in the mind of one of the characters. And further, 
it does contribute to the action and is in more than one instance an indispensable part of it so that to describe human character with circumstances as always the sole motive force in this action would be a serious error but the supernatural is always placed in the closest relation with character it gives a confirmation and a distinct form to inward movements already present and exerting an influence hamlet the third one is shakespeare lastly in most of his tragedies allows to chance or accident an appreciable influence at some point in the action chance or accident here will be found i think to mean any occurrence which enters the dramatic sequence neither from the agency of a character nor from the obvious surrounding circumstances it may be called an accident in the sense that romeo never got the friar's message about the potion and that julia did not awake from her long sleep a minute sooner an accident that edgar arrived at the prison just too late to save cordelia's life an accident that desdemona dropped her handkerchief at the most fatal of moments an accident that the private ship attacked hamlet's ship so that he was able to return forthwith now this operation of accident is a fact and a prominent fact of human life to exclude it wholly from tragedy therefore would be we may say to fail in truth and besides it is not merely a fact that men may start a course of events but can neither calculate nor control it is a tragic fact the dramatists may use accident so as to make us feel this and there are also other dramatic uses to which it may be put shakespeare accordingly admits it a tragedy is a story of exceptional calamity leading to the death of a man in high estate and we may say instead that the story is one of human actions producing exceptional calamity and ending in the death of such a man thank you for watching this video